Hi, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Clayton Littlewood and I'm the author of uh, a book called Don't You Lie, Boy and one called Goodbye to Soho, on sale in four years, on the way out. Uh, that's the plug, I've got that in. Okay, now I wrote these books, uh, they're diaries and they're based on my time living and working in Soho. I have a shop with my partner on the corner of Old Compton Street and Dean Street called Dirty White Boy. And it was a men's clothes shop. So I just first of all want to describe the layout of this shop. So we lived in the basement of this shop. And there were no windows down there. So it was all very dark and gloomy. Um, and it was damp. And it was a bit of a, a, a rat hole, actually. And we had a little kitchen over here. A one ring stove for a kitchen. And a toilet just next to it. And we used to have to go to the gym to have a shower. Uh, sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Um, and then on the ground floor, we have the shop. So if you imagine, this is the shop with a row of clothing along here, and a row of clothing here, and changing rooms back here. And then for the next one, two, three floors above us was one big brothel. And if any of you have been down Old Compton Street and Dean Street, you'll know the place I'm talking about, because it's pretty famous. And we got along really well with these, uh, with these girls. They would often pop down for a cup of tea and tell us who they'd been with that day and what celebrities they'd had up there, which I can't go into now, but a few drinks from now, I can slip a few names. Uh, but the only problem was, because there were so many girls working up there, they were getting through a lot of punters. And because they were getting through so many punters, they were having to take a lot of showers. And every now and again, one of the girls would leave the shower running and the water would come trickling down the walls into our shop, which was a nightmare for us with all this expensive clothing in the shop. So anyway, one night, we were downstairs in bed in the basement, and I heard this dripping noise. And I said to my partner, I said, what's that noise? And he said, you're dreaming. I said, I'm not, I can hear water dripping. And he said, oh, go back to sleep. So after prodding him in the back with my finger and getting no response, <laughs> I, I jumped out of bed, grabbed some clothes, and ran upstairs to the brothel. Now, by the time I got upstairs, it was dark, and the only light was that that was streaming from underneath the brothel doorway. So on hearing voices, and what sounded bizarrely like Madonna's Like a Virgin playing in the background, I knocked hard three times on the door. Hello, anyone in? Hello, can someone let me in, please? And then someone shouted, come in. So I turned the handle, stepped inside, and then I stopped. Because what I thought was someone saying, come in, was actually someone shouting, I'm coming. Now, it took a few moments before I could realize where the voice was coming from, because all I could see initially was this woman on one end of the bed naked, and this other woman on the other end. And they were both bobbing up and down, and one of them had really long blonde hair, and it was flying behind her like a bleach cape bush. And this other woman, and they were both naked, and this other woman's breasts were jiggling up and down like coconuts in a hurricane. Now, because these girls were on the large size, it was only between the bounces, I could actually see there was a long, thin, pale man being pulverised underneath. His, his head was nestled between one of these women's thighs, and the other one is being pulled off like, you know, God knows what. So this is the sight I was confronted with when I walked in. And then one of these women, as she was bouncing up and down, she goes, what is it? Can't you see we're busy? And I said, I think your sink's overflowing. I'm from downstairs. And then she said to the other one, Maggie, did you leave that sink running? And she goes, oh. <laughs> and I said, do you mind if I just go and check? And she goes, well, hurry up, because we've got to get in there in a minute and wash off. So <laughs> I walk into the shower room, and sure enough, there was water all over the floor, and... Five minutes later, I was back in bed, and my partner said, was that a bad dream? And I said, well, you could say that. <laughs> but the next day was really funny, because then the madam came downstairs, and her name was Sue. And she came down, and she goes, oh, your name's Clay, isn't it? And I said, yes. And she goes, I believe you had some trouble last night. I said, yeah, you, you left the tap running, and, you know, we've got expensive clothing in the shop. And she said, look, we don't want no trouble. We've got the police watching us, so, you know, we want to be good neighbours. And I said, well, you know, just, if you can just be careful, you know, you know, it's a bit, you know, difficult for us down here. And she said, well, how about if I offer you some compensation? <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's fine, honestly. And she said, how about a free blowjob on the ass? 
Which I thought was really neighbourly of her, you know. It, it beats a cup of sugar, doesn't it? Um, so they were the girls upstairs, and about a month later, we were lying in bed again, and suddenly, this water starts coming everywhere. Now, this wasn't just a drip. This was, the light fittings were starting to explode. You know, you could see the sparks flying. So we both jumped out of bed. You know, my partner had his underwear. Well, he had a jock strap on, and I had underwear. And we ran upstairs, and the alarm was going off, and, you know, everything. It was buckets coming down. So we called up the fire brigade. I didn't know why we called the fire brigade, but anyway, we called the fire brigade, and then this fire brigade came down Old Compton Street, all the sirens going off, um, and then they burst into the shop, all these big butch firemen. And me and Jorge, we came out on the street in our underwear, and then all these hookers were coming downstairs, you know, half dressed, followed by all their punters. You know, because apparently one of the punters had got drunk and had fallen against one of the water pipes, and it was completely flooding the place. So the street was covered with these girls, me and my partner in our underwear, and these half-dressed punters, and one of them was dressed as a schoolboy. So it was kind of quite a bizarre sight to see. Now after we left that shop, uh, about a year later, I got a call from uh, Sue. I answered the phone, I said, hi, Clay here. Um, and this girl said, it's Sue, the, the madam. And I went, oh, hello Sue, how are you? And she said, the police are trying to shut us down. Would you come to court and be our character witness? <laughs> um, and you've got to say nice things about us. And I thought, oh my God, well, all I had was trouble. But I thought, yeah, yeah, I'll do anything I can, whatever I can to do. So we turned up the next Monday at Horseberry Road Magistrates Court. And we're looking at our watch thinking, oh God, where are they? And then suddenly this big coach turns up and out step 40 hookers. And they were like, you know, Italian girls, East European girls, gay, straight, pretty, not so pretty, all sizes. It was like the United Nations hooker convention. It was really bizarre. So we all jump into court. There's me, my partner, 40 hookers, the madam, and this elderly maid, and the reverend from St. John's Church in Soho. It was quite nice, like something like personal services. So we're in this court. And they call us up one by one, and the police were trying to close them down because they said this drug dealing in the doorway. And then the reverend got up in the witness box and he said, well, this drug dealing in my churchyard, you're going to try and close the churchyard down. So he got up, and then one by one, all these girls got up, and then this elderly maid got up, and she was about in her 80s, and she'd been working upstairs for years, and she got up into the witness box, and it was a really emotional moment. She said... Well, if you close this place down, I've got nowhere to leave. I need the tips. You know, and it was a really sad moment. Um, and then the judge said, well, look, I'm going to adjourn the case. For, I mean, I'm going to hold it for a week and then make my decision. Um, so we all, you know, left. And then a week later, I got a call again. And I picked up the phone. I said, hi, Clay here. And she said, it's Sue from the brothel. We won. We're staying open. And I was really pleased, because I thought, you know, there were really nice girls up there. It's a family unit. And to me, you know, to keep a bit of old Soho still going. And I thought, well, good for them. And they're still there now. So if any of you fancy, you know, <laughs> spending a bit more than a fiver. In fact, I found out it's actually cheaper for um, a fuck than it is a blowjob. So, you know, there you go. And just to finish with one last brothel story, I remember standing, no, two quick ones, I remember standing outside and a guy runs out, shouting, uh, what was it shouting? He goes, I ain't paying for fuck all, no one told me she had a dick. <laughs> so it just makes me think how many people didn't complain. <laughs> And then I remember the last time, just about, about a month before we left, I was outside, you know, standing out the shop, outside the shop, just before it, um, you know, it was early in the morning and the brothel door was closed. And there were these two Japanese guys trying to put this key in this lock. And I said, um, can, it, can I help you? Because, you know, the brothel didn't open until about one o'clock. Um, and he got, um, one of the guys said, and they were a Japanese businessman. He said, oh, we have key. We can use any girl up there we want. I said, well, who told you that? He said, we bought this key, £200 from that man. <laughs> and there's a man, of course, running down T Street. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to end by um, doing a quick plug. <laughs> this is my new 
people, goodbye to Soho, and it's my way of saying goodbye to the brothels on Peter Street that are being closed down, goodbye to the independent shops that are being forced out, goodbye to Paul Raymond, the Colony, Cafe M, but most of all, this book is dedicated to the greatest person in Soho for many, many, many years, the Prince of Soho. Please buy his book from here, Dandy in the Underworld. He's no longer with us. This is dedicated to Sebastian Horsley. something that Anne Whittacombe would soberly enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of today's event. There's a few things that you can do if you've enjoyed this. The very first thing to do is, of course, to download the app. It's completely free. There are loads more stories like this, and we're hoping to keep this running as well to, to produce a second, possibly even third edition. So we want your stories. Feel free. Get in touch with us. And if you want to do more storytelling, or see more storytelling, um, on the back of your Spark menu of tonight's storytellers, you will see that there is um, some blurb about um, a storytelling workshop that's being run next Saturday by Joe. It's on the Canal Cafe, which is also the venue for our weekly storytelling, uh, weekly, monthly storytelling show, first Monday of every month. Yep, and there's of course also Brixton with the open mic sessions. If you go to sparklondon.com, you'll find out a whole load. So if you fancy telling a story or hearing some more true stories, that's the place to go. Um, thank you so much for coming on tonight. You've been an absolute joy. I'd like to finish off by thanking all of the storytellers we've had tonight. So Radcliffe Roy, it's fantastic. Miles, Tony Nixon, Hello. And you didn't pay. But I always do feel 